Hey everyone, before we open today's file, please make sure to follow us on Instagram at d.s.radio where you can find all the images that go along with today's case. You can drop us an email at contact.dsradio at gmail.com. You can find all of our socials in the Linktree bio on our Instagram profile, including links to merch. If you're feeling especially generous, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio, where you can get access to our exclusive Instagram page and make suggestions for upcoming episode topics that you would like us to cover. Speaking of Patreon, thanks to our Patreons, Riff Cult, Cropley Crab, Cash Broadus, Raspberry Jr., Jason R. Nelson, Creepy Paper, Jamie Suit, Michael Laughlin, Lindsay Keller, Mike Wright, Gria Weaver, Kelsey Carithers, Linz Gibbon, Drake Holvig, Only Child, Michael M, Wesley Akers, Riaz K, Emily Medeiros, Pip, Heather Wynn, Graves, Devin Sweatshirt, The Ordained Sinister Minister, and Philip Hoffman. Hey everybody, Chris here from Dystopian Simulation Radio, and this week we've got something a little bit different for you. We are bringing you a classic DSR episode straight from the archives. Unfortunately, this is because Linz and I have both had some family issues going on this week, which have prevented us from writing and recording. Sorry guys, occasionally something will get in the way. So I do very much apologise. Um, we'll explain a little bit later on, but you know the drill. We wouldn't be doing this unless uh, something big had come up. So please bear with us and we'll be back very soon, uh, either next week or the following week. Uh, just depends on how things go. Uh, check out the Patreon. There'll be something special up there just to try and uh, make up for things in the meantime. But thank you so much for all of your understanding. And if you've never heard this episode before, ooh, well, you're in for a treat. And if you have, well, you know what you're in for. Enjoy. Hey, everyone. Before we open today's file, please make sure to follow us on Instagram at d.s.radio where you can find all the images that go along with today's case. You can drop us an email at contact.dsradio at gmail.com. You can find all of our socials in the Linktree bio on our Instagram profile, including links to merch. If you're feeling especially generous, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio, where you can get access to our exclusive Instagram page and make suggestions for upcoming episode topics that you would like us to cover. Speaking of Patreon, thanks to our Patreons, Riff Cult, Cropley Crab, Cash Broadus, Raspberry Jr., Jason R. Nelson, Creepy Paper, Jamie Suit, Michael Laughlin, Lindsay Keller, Mike Wright, Gria Weaver, Kelsey Carithers, Linz Gibbon, Drake Holvig, Only Child, Michael M, Wesley Akers, Riaz K, Emily Medeiros, Pip, Heather Wynn, Graves, and Philip Hoffman. Radio. If you have the questions, we have the answers. My name's Chris. I'm Linz. And we are your co-hosts today for this new file that they're opening up. But first, Linz, how's things? Good, good. Hot off the heels of Jeff the Mongoose, the mm. previous episode. 
I'm excited to sit down and be told a story by you today, Chris. I'm sure you found something strange and unusual. I have found something strange and unusual, but before we get to that little bit of business, so firstly, um, as we talked about last time, we've now launched, we've currently got one episode live and things are going well we haven't shit the bed yet so <laughs> it's all beautiful good. and eloquently put there chris we've had some nice feedback i think that's what you're trying to say yeah and, um... it's been really nice so far and please keep it coming if you have some constructive criticism no problem but what you know we... if you have some constructive criticism keep it to yourself five stars please yeah, but... <laughs> but if you can rate this five stars on any platforms and i do now have in front of me we can we can be found now on apple podcasts spotify stitcher apple music and also there's a variety of other smaller platforms that we've been fed out to automatically as well but they're the main ones get us where you get your podcasts so before we jump into it Linz, are you ready to sell out i was born ready to sell out Chris. right well two plugs that we have here excuse me <laughs> oh god <laughs> so the first plug yes his collection his ever growing collection we'll leave it there <laughs> and just a reminder as well you can reach us on all of our social media platforms which you can find on our instagram which is at d.s.radio and that's the best way to communicate with us and we're always asking for q a questions as well so if you have a question you'd like it's just a, a simple little thing about you know do you think Geth the Talking Mongoose was actually a talking vole or something like that? Feel free to shoot that, that is over ridiculous. To us. Don't ask us that. Ask us like, have we ever been abducted, etc. Yeah, it's more more along the lines. Something you think you'll get a good answer. <laughs> Don't to. ask me anything simple. I'm not here for that. <laughs> now today we're going to go into a very interesting story, which I came about quite a while ago, and it's been sitting there waiting. Now, deep in the recesses of your mind. Deep. Your sordid mind. <laughs> now, before we get into today's story, Linz, I'd like to go through some stats just to set the scene. Okay. Now, in 1990... Oh, nice year. There was just 319 UFO sightings reported worldwide. In 2014, that had spiked to 8,739. According to a YouGov poll, in 2021, half of the British public believe that the government is hiding knowledge of UFOs from us. And between 2004 and 2021, the US government failed to explain 143 unidentified aerial phenomena. That's the new name for UFOs. I just want to set the scene for today's story. So, Linz, once again, we're going to call back to our debut episode, about alien balls, and we are now once again looking to the skies and to other galaxies as we open the file titled The Ilkley Moor Alien. Ooh. Have you heard of this? I think it rings a bell, some far off bells. Oh, we'll see as we go through. Uh, I would just like to cite UFOlogy as the leading source for today's case. It was the <laughs> best report that I could find on it, and I really encourage UFOlogy. you. UFOlogy. Is it a website? And so, yeah, it's a website. So if you search UFOlogy and Ilkley Moor Alien, mm-hmm. you will find that. If you don't know how to spell Ilkley, it'll be in the title of this podcast. Thank you. So, I don't know how to spell Ilkley. No, neither do I. It, <laughs> it has been misspelled about 20,000 times in my script. So, Lens, firstly, could you set the scene for us? And could you tell us what is Ilkley? Ilkley Moor is located in West Yorkshire, in the north of England, close to Leeds and Bradford. It is part of Rumbles Moor, the moorland between Ilkley and Keith. The moor, which rises to 402 metres above sea level, is well known as the inspiration for the Yorkshire County Anthem. On Ilkley Moor Bat. On Ilkley Moor Bat. Ah. On Ilkley Moor Bat. At. Local dialect for on Ilkley Moor without a hat. On Ilkley Moor Bat. At. I can't believe you let me uh, read that. That was a mouthful. I, uh, <laughs> I thought I'd leave it there as a little present for you. You didn't want to read that yourself, did no, you? No, I didn't. Yeah, I thought so. Thank you. <laughs> so we are looking at another uh, UK-based UFO encounter today. We don't exclusively deal with UK stories, but this one just happens to be Now, Ilkley Moor is a wild and foggy place, home to the second highest concentration of ancient carved stones in Europe. 
It's a place steeped in history and myth. The star of our story today is Philip Spencer. Or rather, that is his pseudonym. What? His real name has never been revealed, so that's what we'll refer to him as today. Okay. Now, to give you a little bit of background, Philip, prior to this incident, had served in the London Metropolitan Police Department before retiring and taking the decision to move to Ilkley in North Yorkshire with his family in order to be closer to his wife's parents. Now, being a former policeman, it can be suggested that this would in, uh, assist in giving a reliable witness statement. He's certainly used to giving witness statements and somebody with his background and job experience could be considered someone who's a more credible witness just based off their their training and their background. Those trusty police. Well, exactly. That's why I was saying that with some heavy air quotes around it. <laughs> but You have a thing for aliens and cops. On the 1st of December 1987, Philip went out for his morning walk. Now, this involved crossing the moor from his house to the village where his father-in-law lived on the opposite side of the moor. He made this walk more or less every day. However, it was heavily foggy on that particular December morning. So Philip took several items with him to assist, including a compass for navigation and a camera to take pictures of the early morning light, which apparently is exceptionally beautiful in the foggy weather on the moor. Now this is 1987, so remember there's no smartphones, He's got a manual compass. He's walking along his usual route. So he knows where he's going, but he's just taking some things for precaution. Yeah. Now, he was walking along this usual route, and everything was normal. He'd taken a few photographs on the way, but it was getting more and more foggy. And he noticed something in the distance, something in the fog. He approached it ever closer, thinking, is that an animal? Is it another early morning rambler? No, it was greenish. Is it, is it a green hiking shell suit, as was the style at the time? No, the mist hung heavy in the air. But now Philip was able to make out the shape. It was an awkward looking being. Four foot tall, with long arms and a bulbous head. And it was waving at him. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> he saw a little fella. He didn't just see a little fella. Philip's adrenaline took over. And he grabbed his camera and took a picture of the creature. Linz, would you like to see yes. that photograph? A thousand times yes. There you go. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Why am I, why am I laughing? <laughs> um, it looks like a decrepit cactus has found its way to the moors. <laughs> Come on, Chris. What really, really? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I am. So this this photograph, um, we'll get into its validity and everything else. But for anybody who <laughs> we'll get into its validity. <laughs> <laughs> you can find it on our Instagram page on at d.s.radio, but just to describe it to you. So it's a rather low light photograph. It, there's a clear shape of something there. You can't really determine what it is. It's certainly, when it's suggested, it could be an alien. I suppose you can fill in the gaps and start filling in things here. There's something there, but it's impossible to tell what it is. Let me take a stab at this. Okay. We've got a very grainy photograph. Due to the low light on the moors at the time. Yes, um, I can see, you know, patches of grass and I assume ground. There's a creature, what I assume I'm supposed to be led to thinking is some kind of creature. He's got an odd shaped cauliflower like head, in my opinion. He's got very long arms, you know, his torso and everything in, are in proportion. Then he has kind of small legs, or that's what it looks like to me. And next to it is a black and white enhanced version of that, where, I don't know if this is like pareidolia or something, but you can kind of see eyes and a, and a nose or some mm. kind of I mean, the, expression. The suggestion I, has been put in your mind. And... It has, it has. But I would say that it, it looks like something with arms and legs. 
Now, if the story ended here, it would be quite easy to say, look, this is a hoax. It's a low resolution photograph taken in bad light with something that could just as easily, easily be a paper mache dummy taken from a <laughs> distance. But the story does not end here. Oh no. Thank God. Lens, let's just go back and just, just pretend that this is real, right? Yes, okay. I will suspend my disbelief. You see this in the fog. You've had the wits to pick up the camera and take a picture. What do you do next? Um, I think I would approach the being, although I would fear radiation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not too different from what Philip did. So did, it was... did he say he said hello? Didn't he? Kind of. <laughs> the creature was waving at him. It was, and then turned around. Ah, okay. And began to move away. Philip shouted, hey! And adrenaline took over and he took off running after the creature, ascending up the hill. The creature was described as being awkward and almost shambling more than walking or running. But despite this, it was much faster than a human. A humming sound was growing louder and louder as Philip went up the hill, growing into ever thicker fog. Until suddenly there it was upon him through the fog, a giant silver flying saucer meters from him. The humming was deafening. And then, nothing. Philip was alone on top of the hill. No alien, no spaceship. Only silence. Oh, I got chills. That that's, was good. That's just because I haven't put the heating on. <laughs> it is cold. But, okay, Okay, classic, classic sort of UFO. Stealthy, takes off really quick. I'm gone in a blink. The the thing that really, really got me is you said it turned around, waved, and then went, oh, and kind of yeeted itself back over to the UFO and <laughs> like, took off. And I like the way you said it shambled over the moors. Like, yeah. it has very long arms, so you imagine it, like, knuckle-dragging and yeah. sort of like, that's okay, I like this. But, but Chris... That's, that's not... We'll get into it. Okay. Don't you okay. worry. Now, Philip gathered himself after this bizarre experience and walked from the site of the incident roughly 30 minutes to the town of Menston. So he abandoned his original plan to go and see his father-in-law and went to the nearest place. Um, it was the closest village to where it was. Now, I looked up Menston and its number one attraction is the Tourist Information Centre. Ooh, road trip. Yeah. <laughs> But when he arrived in Menson, he noted that the streets were very busy for quarter past eight in the morning. And when he looked at the local church, the clock on the spire, he realised that it was actually 10am. Missing time. Later, he would also find that his compass was wrong and north was now south. What was going on? He was confused. He suddenly remembered his camera and that he'd taken this photograph. So he rushed to the nearest film development shop. He uh, got it developed that day. And that's the picture that you saw earlier. So he only snapped to this single picture? Yes. Oh my God. Now, Lens, what would you do right now? You've, You've witnessed this. You've taken a picture of it. You've got evidence of some description that supports your story. Who do you go to with this? Well... In these modern times, I would go to Instagram. I would message a bunch of trashy tabloids and get my £500 (laughs) from the Daily Mirror (laughs) or whoever publishes that kind of content. But I suppose back then he... Did he go to a newspaper? Oh, no, he went to the police, didn't he? No, he didn't. didn't. As a former policeman, he didn't go to the police. Because he knew he'd be laughed out of the building. Exactly. He also didn't go to... The papers. Okay. The papers did his, get... His wife? No. The papers did get a hold of it later on, and I'll tell you that story, but it was not released by him or anybody in this research team. It was an, it was another ufologist that... Ah, he went to a professional. Loose lip sink ships. <laughs> so Spencer sought out UFO researchers to research at his local library. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Beautiful. Yeah. Got put in touch with Jenny Randalls, who put him in touch with Peter... I think it's Peter Hugh or Peter Howe. Peter Howe, I think that's how I'm going to um, pronounce it for this episode. Now, he was a well-respected ufologist 
who was well known for taking on cases but being quite sceptical about them. So he wasn't a Mulder coming along to just believe everything. He was initially very weary of this case. He'd heard many a tale of reported evidence that turned out to be a trick of the light or a weather balloon. However, upon meeting Spencer, he was convinced that he was a man of integrity and coupled with his refusal for any profit or fame from the incident, he believed that the case was worthy of a full and lengthy investigation. I feel like people meet people and they say, oh, he was a man of integrity. And I feel like, okay, I went for the cash grab. I was like, I'll, I'm going to the sun. I'm getting my 500 bucks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but this guy, I think he had the long plan, you see, because like, that does look like a paper mache thing. He goes out on the mowers. He knows it's going to be misty. He, you know, demagnetizes his compass. He takes this blurry picture, only one of them conveniently, trashes the paper mache alien, then goes to a ufologist because he knows that if he gets this one guy to take it seriously, that guy will take it all the way to the top. I mean, that's that's one route to, to pursue down here. And, you know, that this will be something we'll be referring to throughout mm-hmm. it. Now, the reason for the pseudonym Philip Spencer has been used is due to this individual's refusal of any publicity or any fame from all of this. So that's why there was a, there's a oh, pseudonym okay. that's used in all of this. So uh, we'll get into it later on, but he's never received a single penny from any of this. Not that we would know. Well, maybe not, not would. Uh, maybe unofficially he hasn't. <laughs> maybe Philip Spencer hasn't received a penny. Well. Now, the first thing that the researchers was uh, some vetting of the physical evidence, just initial stuff before um, actually sending it off to experts. Now, the compass wasn't identified yet, so we'll come to that later. The roll of photo on the camera consisted of five shots, four being landscape shots of the light, as was his intention to be doing, and one being the aforementioned alien sighting. And this is consistent with the story. And also, it can be noted that unless he planned this very, very well in advance, there was no attempt at multiple pictures from different angles as you might assume there might have been in the case of a a hoax photo shoot and they had access to the actual roll of film and and everything else now but if you're going to hoax a picture mm -hmm. you only take that one fuzzy one you no one took takes multiple angles of a cryptid or an alien it's it's it it fits the narrative that he just took one picture Mm. and it's and he's like oh and then it ran the thing is you have to remember at the time as well these are all, this is analog. So you, yeah. can't, you can't just check the viewfinder and go, that's the one. Sufficiently blurry, bad light. Yeah, but back Real. then, people who were into photography could actually True. ban yeah. a camera. Yeah. <laughs> there's, no, there's no suggestion that he was particularly into photography. He's going um, out at 6am to get the sunrise. He is, but he's not taking particularly good photographs. So there's something going on there. I think it's more of a hobby for him. Like a point and shoot. Yeah. Yeah. Now, while the researchers began reaching out to experts to analyse the photos, bear in mind this is going to take time, it has to be sent, the physical evidence, all of these things, Philip went home back to his normal life, bemused by what had happened. Six weeks after the incident, he received a knock on the door to find two men, reportedly named Jefferson and Davies, representing the British Royal Air Force, who stood there and aggressively demanded the photograph from him. Spencer explained that he no longer had the photograph and it was with university researchers currently. They left annoyed and he never saw them again. What? Men in fucking black. Yes, I was just about to say. Even the names are like, yeah. ooh. Sends a shiver up your spine. Yes, I could picture that as soon as you told me. So, okay. So these, these men only showed up this one time. He did, however, contact the British Royal Air Force and inquired about this, who came back to him and said, we have nobody working for us um, who fits that description, who is in your area or who who has been authorised to do this. We know nothing of this. Of course, that's what they would say, but also... Holy! (laughs) Now, the photo was being analysed at the time, first by an animal expert, who confirmed the obvious, but it wasn't any known animal that lived on the moor. That ain't no chimp. (laughs) And also that you could work out that it was around four foot tall. Oh, okay, so we have a height on this Mm -hmm. thing, on this little fella. Now, next, the film manufacturer Kodak was given the 
both the negative and the actual photo, and they confirmed that this appeared to be first and only print of the negative. The negative had not been tampered with and that there was no superimposition at all. So whatever it was, we're not saying it's an alien, but whatever it was, was present there in the actual photograph. Yes, I think that's clear from the photograph. Mm. If you, even in a dark room, there is techniques to, Mm -hmm. you know, insert something that isn't there, but... That's definitely That's not, not one of them. Yeah. However, they did confirm that the lighting conditions were too poor in the original image to be properly enhanced. It was tried anyway, but with no success by both Geoffrey Crawley of the British Journal of Photography and Dr. Bruce Maccabee of the US Navy. Yeah, there's not much you can do with that. No. Now, he had two items, if you remember. He had a camera and a compass. compass. So speaking of the compass, the fact that it was working upside down, was not noticed by Spencer until the 10th of February, so about two months later. At that point, he contacted Howe, who in turn uh, took it to the Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. They analysed it and said it was clear and not up for debate that the compass had been exposed to strong magnetic fields, but it could not be said for certain that this was due to a unidentified flying object. In fact, the phenomenon was actually replicated in lab conditions. And you can do this by rather than exposing the compass to a consistent magnetic field, to a pulsing one. Yeah. And this, uh, for want of a better term, will turn a compass upside down. North is south. You can also do it again back again to return it back to normal. Uh, Reversing the polarity of the compass could technically be done with household objects uh, using a coil of wire and a serious current, i.e. your electricity, but it's highly likely if you did it in the process that you would blow your fuse box up. So, if Philip did this, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. No radiation traces were found in the object. Huh. That's not what I was expecting you to say. Psychologically, Spencer was evaluated at Preston Hospital. And Dr. Jim Singleton put forth, in his opinion, that Spencer was telling the truth as he knew it. Spencer began having vivid dreams of space and the stars. There was only one thing for it. Hypnotic regression (laughs) yes which dr jim singleton also happened to be able to do what oh okay Mm. now this is i looked into hypnotherapy a little bit and its usage and uh, for anyone who's not aware we live in england you could probably tell by our accents we have the national health service here the nhs and most things are available for free on the NHS. Hypnotherapy is not one of those things, and it's not something that most doctors would be trained in. So the only presumption here that Dr. Singleton must have been running a regression business on the side. Yeah, um, that's that's not common, let's just say that. Now, one very important note that we need to bear in mind throughout the next segment here. Howe had uncovered something that he did not share with Spencer. The photo was taken one hour later than Spencer claimed. And this could be worked out due to the lighting conditions unique hour by hour on the moor. Spencer believed that he took the photo as he was walking up the hill. Bear that in mind as we go on here. Now, Lens, no recording has been publicly released of this session, presumably to protect the identity of Philip Spencer. However, one does exist somewhere, and the researchers have them, but it's not been released. But they have released the transcript. There's been an ominous piece of paper sitting on the table. Yes. So what I thought we would do is we would reenact this. I should have guessed. You love this. I'm going to play the role of Philip Spencer, and I would like you to play the role of Dr. Jim Singleton. Ooh, Mr. Singleton. So whenever you're ready, please begin. I want you to cast your mind back to the 1st of December last year when you set off across the moor. I want you to clear your mind back to that and I want you to re-experience that. I want you to tell me what you experienced. I'm walking along the moor. Oh, it's quite windy. There is a lot of clouds. I'm walking up towards some trees. I see this little something. I can't tell but he's green and he's moving up towards me. Oh, I'm stuck and I can't move. And the creature is still coming towards me. I'm stuck and everything's gone fuzzy. I'm I'm floating along in the air. I want to get down. I still can't get down and I, I don't like it. I'm going round this corner and this green thing is in front of me. Oh God, I want to get down. 
There's, there's this big silver saucer thing. There's a door in it. And I don't want to go in there. Everything's gone black now. You say everything's gone black? Mm, I, I can't see anything. Like I'm asleep. I can't hear anything. There's a bright light now. I can't see where it's coming from. I'm in a funny sort of room. And I can hear this voice saying, Don't be afraid. I don't feel afraid anymore. I can see this green thing, but I'm not afraid of it anymore. I'm being put on a table. I can move now if I want to, but I don't feel frightened anymore and there's a beam, like a pole. It's above me and it's moving up toward me. It's got a light in it, like a fluorescent tube. It's coming up from my feet and I can hear the voice saying again, We don't mean to harm you. Don't be afraid. It makes me feel warm as it moves up me. It's coming up over my stomach towards my head. Close to my eyes, I don't want to look in case it hurts my eyes. It's gone. There's something... My nose feels funny. That's gone as well. I'm standing up now. I don't know how I stood up. I can see a door. There's one of those green creatures motioning for me to come with him. I don't really want to go with him. I'd rather stay here and I don't feel afraid in here. Can you tell me what's happening now? I'm walking towards a door. There's still a bright light. There is a light all around. I want to know where it's coming from. It's just bright all around. Walking down a corridor, there's a window. Oh God, is that real? I don't want to be up here. I want to be down there. I can hear that voice again saying, you've got nothing to fear. It's pretty though. I didn't realize it looked so pretty. I've gone past the uh, window now and I'm walking past a corridor. What's happening now? Come to the end of the corridor. There's a hole in it. So I can walk through. I'm in a big room, a big round room. I'm on a raised platform against the wall. My camera and compass are trying to get away from me, going towards the ball. It's difficult to pull them back down. And this ball's moved around with strange, it's got some blocks on it. He says we can't stay in here too long. He wants to go out again, the hole closed in the wall. It's gone strange. He says I've got nothing to fear, but I'd still like to go home. It's got such big hands. What's happening now? Going down a corridor again. It's very bright. I wish I knew where the light was coming from. And there is another door. Going through a door, it's an empty room. Two of those green creatures have come with me. There's a picture. It, it, it's starting to move on the wall. I wonder how they get the pictures. Can you tell me what's happening at this point? I'm looking at pictures on the wall. Pictures on the wall? Ah. Creatures seem concerned at the damage that it's doing. Pictures changing now. There's another picture. Another film. He's asking me a question. He says, do you understand? I said, yes. It's time to go. Everything gone black. I'm walking up the moor again. I'm walking near some trees. Some movement. I, I can see something. A green creature. I've shouted to it. It's turned around. I, I, I don't know what it is. I'll, I'll photograph it. It, it's turning around now. It's moving quick. Want to know what it is. I'm running after it. It's gone around a corner. I can see it now. There's... There's a saucer. <laughs> a, a big silver saucer. Oh, it's, it's disappeared. I'm walking on down past the trees. What's happening now? I'm, I'm, I'm going home. It's ten o'clock on the town hall clock. Really can't understand it. It was only eight o'clock. You mentioned some green creatures. Would you try to describe them to me? It's quite small. He's got big pointed ears and, and, and big eyes. They're quite dark. He, he hasn't got a nose and only got a little mouth. His hands are enormous. And his arms are long. He's, he's got funny feet. Funny feet? They're like a, a, a V-shape, like two big toes. It must be difficult to walk like that. He shuffles rather than walks. I don't feel afraid of him, though. 
he looks odd. You mentioned big hands. Can you say any more about the hands? He's got three big fingers, like sausages. Big sausages. They're just very big. Bigger than my hands. And how tall would you say these creatures are? About four foot. Comes to the lump on my stomach. About as high as just a bit bigger than my stomach is. Okay, now I wonder if I can ask you another question. You mentioned a film? There were two films. Two films? One was lots of scenes of destruction. Like on the news, I can see lots of waste going into a river and the people like Ethiopians who are starving. It, it's, it's, not, it's not very good. It's, it's not very nice. Want to say anything more about the film? It's much of the same thing, only different. What about the other film, then? Do you want to tell me about it? I'm not supposed to. I'll leave that up to you entirely. Do you want to say anything about that? I'm not supposed to tell anyone about the other film. It's not for them to know. Is there anything more? No. Spencer saw an alien with a big sausage. (laughs) We now have an alien sausage to go with our alien balls. He saw this alien, according to this regression, one hour later than he initially believed. This hypnotic regression corroborates the story that the picture was taken later, an hour later due to the abduction responsible for the missing time. Crucially, that hypnotic regression explains why the photo does not sync up with when Philip believed he took it. He did not chase the alien and was then abducted. He was abducted, dropped off, the alien waved him goodbye, and then he took the photograph. So he took it an hour later than he believed, and this is key in the credibility of a witness for Hal and many others that believe in this regression and that it's a valid way of experiencing these things. He mentioned quite early on in that, that he was floating and he wanted to get down. Just to put a bit of additional context to that, he would later describe he was being pulled along in a sort of tractor beam by the alien, like a balloon. That's a nice description, Mm. actually, yeah. Let's, Let's have a little bit of a chat of that. Obviously, I've read this, but this is your first time reading it. What do you make of this story with these extra flourishes and these things that you hear? He's taken on a spaceship. He's given an examination. He's told not to be afraid. He's shown two movies, one of which seems to be showing the destruction of planet Earth and the other, which is a secret and not for others to know. And that seemingly the waking Philip Spencer does not remember. I feel like this has all the classic markings of an alien as an abduction if they take you... Against your will? No, I mean, if they just take you onto the ship and not out of, away from Earth. I mean, you're being taken from where you are. I think that's classed as an abduction. Yeah. Okay. it's a, It's got all the hallmarks of a, a classic. I think actually it's a, cl- there's a, there's a ranking of classes. There is, yeah. I think it might be a class four, like actual interaction and going on board a ship. Yeah, I, I'll yeah. Think I'm, I'm not sure on that. That's off the top of my head. But mm-hmm. this is quite a serious abduction. It's an encounter, at least. Yeah. Um, I think it's got all the classic hallmarks, like I said. Like I like the way that this story was kind of told in kind of reverse order. Like, he just thought, I'm walking up the moor, I take a picture of an alien, and then I chase it and it's gone. It goes into this regression, which is a thing that you see a lot in, you know, alien abduction cases. And then he finds out he's been shown two films. I think that's classic, too. A bit of classic sci-fi there. Like, the aliens take you, they show you the destruction of Earth. And I'm assuming the other film is some kind of either how to stop the destruction of Earth or what Earth would be like post-destruction or something like that. That's my guess, but... Potentially, but we will never know unless Philip regresses again and will break his silence, Mm. which he has not done since then. And also, um, little green men. Mm. Literally little green men. Um, You hear that phrase a lot, but when you read about abductions and encounters, it's normally a grey or a Nordic or something. Rarely a little green man, an actual one. Yeah, and the, from the picture, I mean, it, it resembles somewhat a grey with with a large head, larger eyes, I don't a think thinner so, body. It, it, it's recognisable as an alien in as so much of the public consciousness of one. But 
it's very different from the descriptions from the pictures of other things. Normally, when you see greys talked about, they are essentially human-like. They yeah, are. they're quite slim and they're they just slim. have a larger head and larger eyes. But yeah. this is like a full-on broccoli boy. Yeah, like he's got weird feet with like what's described Knuckle as dragger. odd hands with huge sausage fingers. Salad fingers. <laughs> yeah. Throwback. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, this is an odd creature and this is not something in all of the UFO cases that I've read about. Something that comes up again and again, this kind of description, which could be a plus point, could be a minus point. One thing I will note, though. What did he talk about on the ship? Oh, Properties. the uh, compass. And what? Yeah, so that would explain that. But also, there was balls in there. <laughs> now I'm. I'm not. Oh yes, balls. Yeah. I, I didn't want to interrupt you when we were reading mm-hmm. the script, but you said balls, and I was like, balls, balls yeah, again. There's balls again here. Okay, so he says, we come to the end of the corridor, there's a hole in it so I can walk through. I'm in a room, a big round room, on a raised platform against my will. Going towards the ball, it's difficult to pull them back down again. And this ball's move round with strange, it's got some blocks on it. Now, I mean, I'm not connecting the two cases together necessarily here. It's just interesting that both of the UFO cases we've talked about involve some kind of alien balls. <laughs> but maybe these, if, if I was to be playing, you know, adding two and two together and ending up with the Chronicles of Narnia. Like, <laughs> maybe these blocks that are on the side of these balls can elongate into, Extend. into things. You know, maybe these are, as you said, these are rather awkward beings. So maybe these balls do their bidding, bidding if you will. They, they are their... their alien own. balls. Yeah, they're alien balls. Alien yeah. balls. But, you know, we can't say that. But I just think it's interesting that we've got balls. I think it's case closed. It's a case <laughs> of the balls strike again. The balls strike back. Now, if anybody else out there listening is listening to this episode and our previous de- our debut episode, which included alien balls, and is thinking, yeah, I know another case that involves these balls. Please let us know. We'd love to look into them because I think it'd be a great thing to look at again. In we the want to analyze your balls, so please yeah. send them to Chris's DMs. <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> the spikier, the better. Now, unfortunately, this is where the story ends. So Spencer has continued to claim anonymity and has actually signed over all copyright privileges to Hal. He's basically gone. You take this. I don't want to profit anything from it. However, the two have remained close friends, speak over the years, and are still very much talking about this incident. But Spencer, I think for his own credibility, wants to say, I don't want anything to do with... Yeah, get that away from me. You know, there has been books written on it. There has been cases, this, that, and the other. But Spencer has removed himself from all profiteering from it. His story has also remained consistent through until the present day. And although we cannot take the evidence as fact, the photo has been through a lot of scrutiny and has come up as untampered with. However, as we spoke about earlier, it could be the fact that it was a real undoctored photograph of just a big paper mache dummy. Or a weird shaped tree. One of the researchers, Jenny Randalls, who was the initial person who worked on this case, said the following. The bottom line, as I have often said, is that you can only present the facts as you find them. And in this case, the photo was studied by several photographic labs, including Kodak, the physical evidence by two university labs, and the witness studied by a clinical psychologist. None of these sources found evidence to seriously challenge the case. Now, she also notes in this this same quote that this doesn't mean that it did happen, just that the evidence has a source of credibility to it. Linz, before we move on to theories, you've seen the evidence, you've heard the tale, you heard the regression. What do you think happened? I call bullshit. I call bullshit. Yeah. I call shenanigans on this. I call shenanigans. In the words of Chris, I call shenanigans on this. I love the story, <laughs> of course. But I get that the picture is genuinely a picture of something. That's not really impressive. No. It's a picture of something. There are many pictures of things. There's pictures of things all over the place. But what it is, it is really intriguing. Like, yeah. Obviously, it's a picture of something. I believe that. I believe you went up there and saw something. And I've had a few broken compasses in my time. Mm. And I don't know how they got there. I didn't jam them into any plug sockets. They they just came like that. They were like Aldi specials. (laughs) But um, (laughs) I think that this guy went to take his pictures. He stumbled on something, some kind of plant. You know, I have a, like this weird, I thought it was a bonsai tree, now I'm not sure what it is, but it looks like... I thought it was a bonsai tree, I now know it's a cat. 
it's a small alien <laughs> sitting in a dish. <laughs> no, but um, now it's starting to resemble like, you know, a mandrake root. Mm-hmm. It just looks like a little person sitting on a rock with its back to you. And everyone who walks past it goes, that looks like a little person with its back to you. And I'm just like, I'm wondering about the scale of this picture. Mm-hmm. Like, is it actually like as the di- the dimensions that he is claiming that it is? Like, is that thing four feet or is this like a Loch Ness thing where it's just a mm-hmm. zoom in of something really small? Well, it's been verified by Kodak. Yeah, as being, as being legitimately being a legitimate. photograph. I, I believe that. But, but also that it was everything surrounding it and ah, so, so on. so it is that the it dimensions. Is, you know, four foot. Like, okay. It also, I do believe that somebody went to the lengths of recreating the photograph in the same place get the proportions right but one thing we can say is whatever it was was four foot and weirdly up to the bump what what, he said the lump in my chest i'm like are you the lump in his stomach are you okay philip i think you should see somebody this old guy this alien old guys are not waiting long enough for the nhs services (laughs) you know they're not robert taylor walked off after two hours he's got a lump (laughs) my two explanations one maybe they put something in him and the the lump that he's talking about he's referring to something that's been you know popped inside him. i think he's saying that he's got like a dad bod <laughs> maybe he's got an audi he's got a dad bod it's got, it's got a little pot going yeah. on and he's got a little little, little lump coming out the end <laughs> poor man maybe that's why they took him they've cured him just like i my theory in the robert taylor well that seems to be what sort of happened here which is that they've given him a medical examination yeah and either he's fine or they've cured him of something they've been very nice to him don't be afraid. You know, they, they, what he's describing when he says, oh God, I don't want to be up here. I want to be down there. They've taken him along a corridor and he's looking at Earth. Mm. So he's getting the astronaut's view. Oh, so they actually Earth. took him away. They took him on a little, they took him into the atmosphere. He got a medical examination for free. He got a little <laughs> tour. Not we can only get that down here. <laughs> not only a tour in a spaceship, but he got to see the blue ball from way up high. Took him yeah. to, they kidnapped him and showed him a bunch of balls. Yeah. Now, that's what most people don't want to happen. You got free balls. Especially when they say, don't be scared. I'm just going to show you my balls. And he also got two or three movies. Like us. In, um, when, yeah, like, talked, like in the previous we... episode, Chris brought up how we snuck into two movies. It was Sin City and a Star Wars movie. We snuck in for free. So, you know, uh, we've got a lot of things in common with these abductees, <laughs> yeah. They seem to be, though, if you believe the story rather benevolent that you know making sure he's okay don't be afraid and then they are trying to seemingly teach him a lesson why they're teaching him a lesson or are they doing this to as many people as possible trying to implant these ideas into everybody or it's not fucking working or <laughs> they're like some experimental noise core alien man that just wanted to show him their work <laughs> check out my sick movie bro and then they have a movie playing in the background of like destruction <laughs> no. and he was like i don't want to be here and they were like another fan loss another potential fan loss they just don't get it they're so behind in the times <laughs> take his wristband <laughs> yeah. that reminds me of when i watched a man it was a noise show so I, I don't know why i'm complaining but i walked in there and it was just a man shoving a change saw into a table and that was that was the show. So I think this was a sort of alien abduction style. Nobody wants to watch our show. This guy with a lump will. We'll cure him <laughs> for free and everything. <laughs> so much like with Robert Taylor. Mm-hmm. And if you haven't listened about an episode, please go back to the first episode that we did. The simplest theory is that it happened as described. Yes. Philip Spencer was abducted. He was shown these things. He was returned to Earth. It's the simplest explanation, but the most unlikely explanation as well. The UK tabloids, when they got a hold of it, as I referenced a little bit earlier, through a, another ufologist who couldn't keep his mouth shut about it, but not somebody who was in the inner circle of this investigation, put forth that it was actually an insurance salesman in a blue anorak on a bike with a briefcase in his hand. <laughs> now, they will go far to sell yeah. insurance. This was actually a joke. Give that guy a raise. <laughs> I know, biking up a mall. <laughs> Come on, in the fog, take... hoping you see someone approach through the mist. <laughs> Hello there, sir. <laughs> Can I interest you? He's like a Jehovah's Witness of um, insurance. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was actually a jokey comment made by the ufologist who said, take a look at this big... I mean, it could just be an insurance salesman in an anorak on a bike. And uh, the tabloids <laughs> went, let's run with that story. <laughs> of course they did. It could also be, as uh, experienced 
potentially by Bob Taylor, uh, about a TLE or some other kind of brain trauma. And this just manifests itself in this. The moor itself is actually famous um, because of its ancient heritage stone carvings as a site where fairies and goblins were traditionally seen in past days. And what you have to ask yourself is, are aliens a modern day interpretation of that? What that means, I don't know. That either means that there are beings on there that are being seen and interpreted as different things, or potentially Spencer had heard about this, something happened, it was in his mind's eye on that foggy day. But if that was the case and he knew about the, the supposed goblins and fairies that live out in the moor, why did he see an alien and not a goblin? Well, to be honest, I would say that looks more goblin than alien. True. When it's coupled with the flying saucer. Yeah, I mean, it's a standalone image Mm -hmm. that looks like some kind of, like I said, broccoli boy, goblin (laughs) creature. Broccoli boy. Yeah. That is a theory for aliens, though. Like, Mm -hmm. people think that when people used to see these these mythological creatures and whatever, you know, sprites, various goblins, that it was actually aliens. Mm -hmm. Like, that is a theory that people who believe put forward a lot like that people have always seen aliens they just had different names so if that's the truth then for whatever reason ilkley moor is a hotbed of potential historical alien activity i feel like another road trip it's is just on the cards we are just designing down the road. <laughs> yep we are designing a great road trip here from scotland to york <laughs> now of course the obvious other thing that we can say is it just made the whole thing up but... yeah but it seems it it seems a bit silly because he's not getting anything from it Exactly. It's it's probably the least likely of all of these, to be honest. It's more likely that he had an experience, misinterpreted it as this, and as the doctor said, is telling the truth as he knows it. He's got no reason to lie. He's never profited from it, even to the degree that Bob Taylor did, which was minimal. As a former policeman, he is one of the most unlikely people to make up such a fantastical story about this, and certainly somebody who would be quite conscious of being taken seriously and perhaps losing all credibility. I think that's probably why he didn't want his name attached to it, because he'll look like a loon. I'm painting the entire police force with a big brush there, and there are bad bobbies out there as well. There are people bad bobbies. People who might be inclined to make something up, but in general, let's just picture PC Plod over there. Probably (laughs) unlikely to be making up a story about aliens and quite used to giving witness statements. So that's that's kind of the X factor in this, which is a bit like Bob Taylor. Bob Taylor was a very believable man. Everybody believed him. Yeah. And that seems to be the same but theme see, that's running through this. Bob came out loud and proud. Saw mm-hmm. a spaceship. Balls came out. Told the story. Put his name to it. This guy... Not putting his name to it. Maybe it's his suspicious nature as a cop. Maybe. He's want to be ridiculed in the Daily Star. Bob may have, I mean, if he'd had hypnotic regression, unfortunately he's not here to do this anymore, but if yeah. he'd had hypnotic regression, maybe he also saw movies. Now, probably the most likely explanation is that if the conditions on the moor made Philip think that he saw something in the fog, he passed out and lost time, and the regression is a dream of some sort, or what he experienced when he passed out. Yeah, that's a bit difficult to say because he had no physical ailments. He had nothing wrong with him. It wasn't he wasn't disorientated when he woke up. He wasn't he didn't feel funny, he didn't smell oil like um Yeah, he like didn't the, have any symptoms that he, most people have when they talk about being abducted. He was just boom and he's back in the room. Yeah. Oh, I'm on the moor. What's that? Yeah. Which is different from what we've talked about previously. It also doesn't explain the photograph um, and only tangibly explains the regression and the explanation of the lost time. The whole case really does rest on the credibility of the witness and the photograph. And as we've talked about, the photograph is obviously under quite a lot of question. The compass, I think, can be just dismissed because it could be replicated easily at home. It's just something that I think is by the by. The photo does have something to it, real alien or not. It is a legitimate photo, not a photoshopped monstrosity or a trick of the light. If you take it at face value for a moment that this is a real photograph, this whole story has surreal overtones to it. and Almost too much. Abduction, benevolent aliens, men in black, reversed polarity of devices, photographic evidence. It is the perfect 
UFO story. And for exactly that reason, many people are wary of it. It's almost too good to be true. Lots of ufologists have said we're not publishing that in there, despite the credibility of how. That's just something that a lot of people have gone, ooh, hold on. So even ufologists kind of shy away from this one? They shy away from it, I think, because of the evidence. If that photograph... Because of this picture? Because of the picture. If the photograph wasn't there... Yeah, they might be more they likely might be more to go open for it, to do but it, but because it looks so silly. It looks, it does, and it does look silly. I love it. Like, I, I want this it. on my wall. I want it framed. Wow. We need it in the office, the research <laughs> office. Christmas is coming. <laughs> it is, as I said, the perfect UFO story. Almost too good to be true, but that is the story of the Ilkley Moor alien. Lynn's final word, Philip Spencer. Are you still calling bullshit? Did he see an alien, and was he abducted by them? I think I have to say, I don't know what he wanted, but I don't believe him. I want to believe. You Uh. always want to believe all of these alien cases are true. I think I believe Bob more than I believe this guy. And I don't know why. I don't know if they did a good job of like um, the way they wrote about Bob, how he's such a reliable guy. And I've heard the audio files and everything. But this I got. I don't know why I think Bob's drawing that he just sketched from his mind, is more convincing than this picture. It's odd, isn't it? I think... It's got a 70s unexplained photo, like, published in an unexplained photos book. Like, I have a book that I'm going to bring around next time for you to look at, and it's full of pictures like this. And it just... I feel like it... And they've all been since debunked. It's from the 70s. Mm. And I feel like this would just fit in there. It's not that different on the surface, from the famous Bigfoot photograph. It's blurry, there's something there, but you can't really say, yeah, that's Bigfoot. Yeah, but that's somebody off in the distance who saw a thing, tried to take a picture, didn't do a great job. This is a guy who said he had a whole experience. That's true. Bigfoot didn't invite that guy back for tea. No, no, no. He wasn't waving in a picture and all that. Well, he was kind of like sassily walking like... Well, come back, I've got a seal in the tub. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't believe him. And I think it might be how he's r- remained anonymous. Like, if you if you really see it, I think you should put your name to it and be like, yeah, I saw it, so what? Like, here's my picture. It totally happened. I don't care if you believe me. Like, I think I need a face and a name to this claim. I would agree. I'm going to, despite the evidence, and this is a photograph of an alien, supposedly, doesn't look that alien-y to me. What I'm more interested in, to be honest, and the reason that I was really captivated by the story was the transcript of the regression. And that, I think, it's got a little bit more, there's just something to it. But easily, we can't hear a recording of this. We did a a wonderful reenactment for you earlier. I think that's probably exactly how it went. I think so. However, we haven't heard the recording. One question about the photo. I just noticed looking at it here while we were talking, I've been staring at it. What's that? His, His sausage. The legs. Oh. You see, it goes like that and like that, and the same on the other, on the other leg. But the other leg is kind of obscured by his, his long sausage hand. I think that we should, on the Instagram, um, draw around this. I think so. To show people. And we'd love to know what you think. We had some people come back to us and say Bob Taylor was full of bullshit. <laughs> so. I also had people come and say that I believe in Bob. I believe in Bob. Which will be an upcoming sticker, everybody. Hell yeah. I believe in Bob, but I believe in Bob more than I believe in Philip Spencer. He's kind of like the anti-Bob. Me too. Mm. Yeah, I, I think we've got two opposing kind of characters here. We have the hero, I think that's Bob. We have this shady Spencer guy who's, you know, he's got a lot of claims. The FBI, the men in black have showed up to his door. Then he's called and inquired and they don't exist. And this is a lot of tales. Maybe he's scared to come out. That's why, because authorities got involved. Maybe. But I think if he put a face and a name to it, this story would be something else. I think so. Again, we want to know what you think. Please leave a comment on our Instagram or drop us a DM. Let us know what you think. So we're going to wrap things up now, but just a a quick uh, wrap up of a few of things. So firstly, the best way to get in contact with us is via our Instagram page at d.s.radio. You can also find on there our link tree which links to all of our other platforms as well. 
if you are listening to us on Apple's podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, or whatever the hell it is that you listen to podcasts on, what would really help us is if you left us five stars. Bing, 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 bing. That's the sound that it makes. And it'll give you a warm feeling inside. If you do want to contribute monetarily to us, buy us a coffee. You can also find our tip jar on Linktree. And remember, we're always looking for your Q&A questions. So drop us a DM on Instagram. Slide into those DMs. (laughs) Thank you so much, Chris, for another alien story. Enjoyed it. Living for the picture, framing it on my wall. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening. And we will see you next time. So until then, keep your eyes on the sky.